Craig Thompson from Memorial Sloan Kathleen. The role of cancer metabolism in creating an immunosuppressive uh, tumor microenvironment. So maybe at the junction between the tumor and the immune cells. Well, I um, have to say on many levels, it's exciting to be here and to be in person in a meeting talking about the latest ideas in tumor immunology. So I really want to thank uh, the organizer, both Hugh and Elaine, for inviting me, an old-time immunologist who's come back to the field. Uh, so I'm going to start with some of the students, um, maybe even older than Jerome told us about it, but takes you about the tumor immune system. Um, before we get started, the people currently in my lab that are doing the work um, are actually the newer data that I'm going to show that was done during the pandemic was done by Santosh Vardana. Uh, with uh, Madeline He, who is now has his own lab, but is fortunately going to stay and collaborate with us in Memorial Sloan Kettering um, for our work in the tumor microenvironment. We've each taken up a cell type, so we have people working on macrophages, on stromal cells, particularly uh, fibroblasts, uh, and uh, increasingly we are interested in the intersection between those cells and the tumor cells through the metabolic environment. That's what. I, I gave as a provocative title. Um, I have a few disclosures. All of them will disavow any knowledge that I'm giving this talk and wouldn't agree with most of this. This is to attempt to be provocative because that's what we're doing, uh, getting meetings going forward. So I don't think anything will be a conflict going forward, but we, we will reach out to anyone to help figure out the problems we want to solve. The model system that I started in immunology, and I'm going to tell you about an experiment that Carl June and I and Tulia Linston, who sits in the second row, did together uh, exactly 30 years ago. Because we were really interested in a problem, and that problem was how you ever made, you don't have enough B and T cells to mount any specific immune response. So it doesn't really matter whether you're going to be entered tumor immunity or you're going to fight off a virus like COVID, you just simply don't have enough precursors of specific cells with specific antigen recognition to actually do anything. So you have to have a proliferative advance. It had been, dendritic skills have been discovered in the preceding decade, were known to be potently antigen presenting, would come from an inflammatory lesion, whether it was in this particular example that I just pulled off uh, the web from a couple of years ago. Um, let's see if I have a pointer here. Does this work? Yes, it does. Uh, and so dendritic cells at the site of antigen exposure to a foreign antigen or a tumor antigen in a dying tumor cell take up uh, local antigens and migrate to the professional lymphoid organ. That was the model. And there they went through clonal expansion. And all we wanted to do is figure out how that actually worked. Because no one could figure out how to make, put in the cells, stimulate with the mitogen, and get more human T cells out. And so we simply looked at every combination of mitogens that anybody had ever reported and simply said, is there one that'll give us more cells? It was a pathway that we were interested in. That pathway became CD28, the co-stimulatory pathway that we know about. And this field depends on, if we're honest, to actually amplify the cells that are either gonna become CAR T cells or are actually part of the effector molecules that are used that are unmasked when we unmask the inhibitory effects of PD-1 or CTLA-4. And the simple experiment, Carl put the two antibodies that cross like the T cell receptor and CD28 on a magnetic bead, and we simply asked 50 volunteers. What that meant was technicians in the lab and postdocs and students in the lab to actually donate 10 mLs of blood. And this is the results of one of those experiments. I actually know the name of the technician whose cells these are. Out of that 10 mLs of blood, we collected 5 million CD4 cells, although it works with CD8 cells as well, but we started with CD4 cells. We started with 5 million cells. We put them in the continuous presence, passaging them every three days with uh, anti-CD28 and anti-CD3 beads. And this is their growth curve over that period of time. Five million cells for the students in the body, that's just enough to see at the bottom of a tube if you spit it down, whatever your favorite tube is. This is 100 kilograms of tissue. That's the proliferative capability of our lymphoid cells. These cells stay polyclonal. That's why we can use them for CAR T cells. That's why we think about them as the effector molecules, whatever their specificity is, can be unmasked by this non-specific clonal amplification. And that got us interested in this. At the time, and Lou just asked a great question about what are the transcriptional profiles 
So Carl was really excited about the idea that there would be an unmasked new transcriptional profile. Many people had studied the T cell receptor signaling and saw that it turned on many genes and provide information code for immune cells to get activated. And so we asked, what happens when you stimulate with CD28 and got nothing on gene expression race? And then we did the combination of the two and we got the following result. So here are the 3,000, I think the number is 3,665 genes that are turned on when you cross-link the T cell receptor on a polyclonal population of T cells. And what you can see is some of them go up and some of them go down. It's about an equal mix as cells go from a resting state to an activated state. But that's pretty cool. That's almost, uh, what, what is that? It's about 15% of your genome changes in a meaningful way. And then we added co-stimulation through CD28 and we got four more genes. All four of those, you take any other nonspecific antibody that binds to the cell and you get the same four. There were no new genes or change in expression by co-stimulating CD28, even though you get this potent proliferative expansion of cells. But what you can see, and this is all I want you to take away from this, is every gene that is red is now redder. And every gene that is green is now greener. What CD28 allowed the cells to do things more precisely. Genes it needed to turn on, it turned on better. Genes it, genes it needed to turn off, it turned off better. And that required a non-transcriptional, non-new program explanation. And that's what my lab has spent the last 20 years studying and drifting away from the immune system. We came to the idea that the new transcriptional and translational programs necessary to affect T cell amplification and then effector function require information that comes primarily from the T cell receptor. That's all the genes that change in expression. But what wasn't accounted for was the need to have resources to fuel that alteration in biology. And so as we studied the CD28 pathway, we discovered it was a primary regulator of first glucose and then bulk amino acid transporters. The ability to have the resources, the supply chain, to affect what the T cell receptor through new transcription and translation was allowing the cell to do. And downstream of that, we also found an independent role, which is why most of you also in your cultures that growing up T cells put IL-2 or any of the common gamma chains. We heard about IL-15 in an earlier talk. It will substitute for IL-2 in this. They turn on glutamine metabolism. And those are the two major carbon and nitrogen sources used to fuel growth and differentiation in every lineage in our body. And these are the cues that tell professional immune cells to take them up to affect your function and to carry out your job of protecting the body through immunity. So we've got into a lot of molecular detail. I'm not gonna make you go back and learn your biochemistry over again. Um, the primary pathway that CD28 cooperates with the T cell receptor to activate is the PI3 kinase AKT TOR pathway that reprograms cells to take up bulk glucose, commit it to glycolysis, That's was known already at the time that lymphocytes taken primarily from inflammatory lesions were preferentially glycolytic, and that's because of the co-stimulatory properties of the CD28 pathway. That flooding of glucose into the system allows the mitochondria to fully saturate the cell's ATP needs and have excess left over to build new phospholipid bilayers and all the lipid signaling moieties that an immune cell will ever need, because all its de novo lipid synthesis comes, as we showed, from the secretion of excess citrate at the start of the TCA cycle that then is broken down to provide the building blocks for lipid biosynthesis as cells build daughters and build lymph inflammatory effectors through, through uh, various lipid intermediates. At the same time, TOR activates bulk amino acid transporters on the cell surface. To, it allows those translators to increase tRNA charging and increase the initiation of translation. And that fuels amino acids from being burned in the TCA cycle, and a resting cell will do, into being sequestered into protein biosynthesis. And so the primary role of the CD28 pathway is to do something immunologists had called blastogenesis, get bigger and get ready. A cell gets bigger as a result of this co-stimulation through CD28 because it's a bag of protein surrounded by lipids and it's really good at affecting whatever the T cell receptor has said is new protein or a new lipid that's needed to do biology. It didn't solve the proliferative problem, so a few years ago we went back and looked hard at this, 
Um, and the common answer, at least in lymphoid cells, is the IL-2 receptor common gamma-gene family activates through JAKs and STATs. Uh, transcription factor known to many of the people that work on the, on the transformation of lymphocyte side of the arena here at this meeting to activate a transcription factor, MYC. And MYC is the other gene that cooperates in signal transduction to make full metabolism ability uh, so a cell can proliferate because as glutamine is taken up, glutamine initiates the ability to build um, purines by initiating on uh, addition of ribose, uh, the nitrogen that initiates purine biosynthesis, and it fluxes into the TCA cycle by being deaminated to produce aspartate, which is the initiation of pyrimidine biosynthesis, and now cells can make proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, and they're off to the races with a five-hour cell cycle time. Because when they have those three building blocks and the information in the codes that comes from the T cell receptor signaling to enter the cell cycle, that's all they need to go forward. And that's how you get that proliferative expansion that I showed you. The model when we started, so that, that explains what happens. And it made a very satisfactory, at least teleologic argument. Because it really says that the reason why you do lymphocyte expansion in lymph nodes is that's the most vascular region you can depend on to have excess nutrients in your body. Lymphocytes are fully bathed with the lymphatic system as well as the vascular system, and it's constantly replenished at a higher rate than any other tissue in the body. So if you're gonna do maximum proliferation and you've gotta breed building blocks and you're telling the cells to take them up, it's the perfect place to go through clonal expansion. And so what that says is that's where you initiated immune response, but you don't tell the T cell, and that's what we now know in subsequent 20 years of investigation, you're not telling the T cell there what to do. What you get is a naive but mature T cell that has a specific T cell receptor on its surface, and it's going to go off to places where it might do its job. The model at the time was that cytotoxic cells, but also we now know CD4 cells, migrate to sites, in this case for what we're interested in rather than an infection, is tumor immunology, and there where they encounter their antigen, their antigen receptor would be re-stimulated. They wouldn't need to proliferate it again, so they might not need co-stimulatory signals, but they have to have effector function and kill you. And so the argument was is that they were fully effector function when they are circulating and leave the lymph node. And I think one thing we know as a community now is that's not true. The cell that leaves the lymph node is naive. By and large, it is not ready to be a full effector cell. And that's why the tumor microenvironment that we've heard in so many talks and the other cells that participate in the tumor environment are so important. And that's why we're trying to figure out why checkpoint blockade doesn't work in every patient, but only about a third. And why CAR T cells only work in half of patients, even though we give it to everybody with hoping for an optimum result. And so we started thinking a lot in the last two years, because we didn't have much else to do during the pandemic, about what's going on out here in the effector phase when T cells have gone through this clonal amplification that we have been modeling by T cell receptor and CD28 co-stimulation, showing at the time that CTLA-4 turns that response off so one clonal lymph node can take over for the other. So that's really CTLA-4's job, is to actually, at two weeks, turn off a proliferating clone within a lymph node. Uh, but out in the periphery, as T cells are engaging their TCR, they should, in the simplest model, be effector cells. And we began to know, and we've heard in several of the talks, inhibitory molecules in the CTLA-like 4 or CD28-like family that are inhibitory in their functions, like PD-1, are in fact blocking, by being put on the tumor cell, blocking the ability of this cell to be an effector if it's a CD8 cell and killing a tumor cell. That didn't make a lot of sense to us. And so, we think that one of the paradigm problems that we have as a field is the idea of just adding back a checkpoint blockade inhibitor is going to get you back to the original problem that we started with. You've got a naive cell, you're engaging the T cell receptor, and it really doesn't know how to do anything else other than die. And so it's the other things in the environment, and that was, what, that was originally the discovery of clonal deletion and negative selection. And so what else do you need in the environment of a, lymph, of a tumor when a cell infiltrates that actually is informative is what we've been thinking about and studying. And as we've heard from many of the talks so far, the tumor microenvironment is a really pretty complex place. There's macrophages that are in critical roles as part of the innate immune system. There are innate lymphoid cells. 
There are a whole variety of cytokines that tumor and stromal cells are putting down. Stromal cells are trying to produce a new matrix to fix what they see as an inflammatory lesion. And tumors are gobbling up things in the environment just to propel their proliferation. And so each of these cell types is playing a regulatory role. And there's really good people, as we've heard already from this talk, studying each of those things. So we asked, what can we add to this? Since we're on this metabolic kick, we started to say, well, one thing that characterizes human tumors when they're carried out is that they're almost always, because the tumor is growing, because there's this dense inflammatory, whether it's pro-inflammatory, inhibitory inflammatory, it's consuming oxygen, it's consuming glucose, and it's depleting amino acids. And so the environment pathologists have been telling us for 50 years of a tumor microenvironment is depleted of oxygen, is depleted of glucose and high in lactate, and it is, in fact, depleted of amino acids, particularly non-essential amino acids, which I won't have time to talk about. So one simple experiment that Santosh did was to simply say, let's try and mimic this kind of environment, and let's take our favorite things, manipulate the metabolism, and see what happens to the effector state of naive T cells we've just clonally expanded. And ask what happens. Now, there are really cool experiments to understand the, the IL-17 subtype of T cells and regulatory T cells. So we simply did that experiment. I'm not going to show more than to be provocative here today. Um, here are cells put into neutral proliferative conditions with CD3 and CD28 and a small amount of TGF beta, which should either facilitate IL-17, an inflammatory state, or a regulatory T cell state. So agnostic to this. And then, in addition, we use standard media that we all use, except we either depleted the non-essential amino acids, oxygen, or we made a low pH by, buffer it, by altering the lactate concentration. And what you can see is in every single case, as you bioenergetically limit the resources the cell has to become a terminal effector cell, it chooses only one of the possible fates it has left. It chooses to be a FOXP3 regulatory cell, and it loses its ability to produce, I guess I took the gamma interferon off, which is the other marker here. So we heard about this pro-inflammatory theorem from Jerome in the preceding talk. You need gamma interferon to stimulate that pathway. It's completely turned off if you provide either a depletion of the non-essential amino acids, the oxygen, or the, or the glucose that a cell depends on to drive not just its clonal proliferation, but its terminal effector function at its site of initiation, of differentiation. And so one thing the tumor microenvironment does is it leads to the accumulation of regulatory cells. Just as Miriam and others have shown, it leads to the accumulation of M2 macrophages, which are immunosuppressive. Um, but we started to realize that there was even more than that. If we add checkpoint blockade, you find that it's not as simple as just turning cells on again you find that some cells adopt new fates. Some cells actually begin to proliferate again. And some cells end up as exhausted cells that just accumulate and don't die. That's this T cell exhaustion phenotype. And we become interested in how that happens as you release checkpoint blockade and you continually stimulate cells because their antigen is present and they're able to actually be activated through the T cell receptor why do they get all these different fates, and what is manipulating those fates? And so Santosh and his colleagues built a model that really simply says, let's only provide repetitive T cell receptor uh, stimulation through MHC antigen. Right? And with transgenic mice, you can do this by making a transgenic mouse that's specific against one peptide in the course of one MHC, and simply starting to tit titrate back repetitive antigen put while you're doing and a clonal expansion of T cells. And the model, uh, and the reason he wanted to do this was because there's some wonderful data that had come from many other people. So one of the things that we're really grateful in this community is you all do these amazing studies. We can read them, and then we can model them and try and understand if we can recapitulate what you see in human or mouse models from a metabolic standpoint. And so this actually insight came from, in fact, a couple of really beautiful studies that were done doing RNA-seq on, on either patients, melanoma patients, or cheated checkpoint inhibitors, or mouse models. And the surprising result was 
that when people isolated the so-called terminally, terminally exhausted cell types that they were seeing accumulate, they had this really unusual phenotype. They looked like our CD3 and CD28 stimulated cells. They were highly glycolytic. That has been reported since the early 1970s in the first mitogens to be incredibly correlative with an effector, a proliferative response of T cells, except these cells by all criteria were exhausted. And the cells that were able to be reactivated and had a memory-like phenotype, as was said in this original characterization of cells that responded to checkpoint blockade, actually at the baseline was using oxidative phosphorylation. And when people looked also at uh, an independent study at checkpoint, they found exactly the same people. People that didn't respond to checkpoint blockade, their T cells preferentially had a glycolytic phenotype and the responders preferentially used oxidative phosphorylation. That's because I think we miss as a community understanding why, what you actually need during cell proliferation. The mitochondria is essential in carrying out its TCA cycle activity to provide the building blocks of an effective effector T cell. You cannot build an effective T cell without oxidative phosphorylation being intact. And the reason we got confused is because when two T cells through receptors are activated to take up more glucose than they can use, even when they're going through a five hour cell cycle, they'll look like they're doing glycolysis and secreting it because they simply have to maintain carbon neutrality. And so we thought this might actually be reflective of a loss of turning off the mitochondria from being functional to being non-functional the classic thing you learned in biochemistry around anaerobic glycolysis, except this isn't the lack of oxygen, this is the lack of something else. And that's what we've been building a model system to study. And the simple model system is to take an ova transgenic mice, um, and so we can take T cells from that mouse and activate them with an ova peptide, which will be presented by their MHC and IL-2, and get uh, continuous proliferation of these cells that should mimic it's giving them the stimulatory cytokine, and it's giving them appropriate TCR engagement uh, of their cells over time and culture. And comparing that to the way we normally grow cells in culture over time, which is just initiate a first antigen presentation and perpetuate the culture by continuous addition of IL-2. So the difference in these two culture systems is these are acutely stimulated cells that their proliferation and survival is maintained by common gamma chain receptor cytokines. And these cells are stimulated every time they're passaged, they get a new burst of antigen. They're seeing antigen all, all over again every time they see, as they would in a lesion, a tumor cell. And what you discover is once one, the acutely stimulated cells maintain their ability to produce the acute inflammatory cytokines here, mimicked by TNF-alpha, but it's also true of gamma interferon. And the other cells are exactly the opposite. They lose their ability to produce TNA. If they're repetitively antigen stimulated, they now turn on inhibitory receptors, and they are actually engaged in being suppressed. And when you mimic their phenotype, you find they're exactly phenotype what we was just reported in those two human studies of exhausted T cells. So the phenotype of the chronically stimulated cells look like the terminally exhausted cells and the acute cells look just like the cells of responders. And that worked uh, in, 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 in both directions of the assay. Uh, and so what you can see is that also because these two transcription factors have become pathognomonic in, in, in humans and mouse studies, uh, of the effectors phase. Uh, this is TCF1, a, a central transcriptional cofactor of T cell differentiation as effector molecules. And here's TOX1, which is a transcription factor necessary for survival if you're terminally exhausted. And it precisely mimicked this culture system allowed one cell to take effector cells and one cell to become these terminally uh, differentiated um, exhausted T cells. And then we could me metabolically characterize them. And so if you take and take the same, same culture system and now just simply say at each passage, how much glucose are they consuming, how much lactate they're producing, that's sort of index of their um, glycolytic pathway, you can see the chronically stimulated cells, just as was predicted by that phenotype of humans that were resistant uh, to checkpoint blockade activation, they're highly glycolytic, the chronically stimulated cells. And just as the responders were predicted to use oxidative phosphorylation, they were the acutely stimulated cells maintained on IL-2, 
were actually very conservative in their use of glucose. Yet, the acute cells proliferate like mad, and the chronic ones have a very small clone size and look exhausted and don't acquire effector molecules as I just showed you. Beyond that, they can't respond to T cell receptor signaling by activating further their ability to consume oxygen consumption. So they're not able to engage in this burst of electron transport activity for ATP production, or more importantly, TCA cycle, to build the building blocks that are necessary for effector function. And so that was a real puzzle, and it occurred progressively over time. The ability of mitochondria to function declined progressively with each stimulation of the T cell receptor. So these are the questions that they set out to solve. I'm gonna go very quickly through what they found. If you do a metabolomics profile, we haven't seen one of those before, look for the 1,200 metabolites that the cells might have, and then just do the usual outlier analysis, things that have gone way up, and things way up, or yellow, things that have gone way, way down. Tulia must have done this because this is the Swedish flag's national colors or something. But we're very dramatic feedback. happen. All the things turned down were the ability to make trinucleotides. And all the things turned up was what you get if you can't phosphorylate, you can't carry out oxidative phosphorylation. These cells are defective in oxidative phosphorylation. The ratio of bioenergetics, which is best measured by the ATP AMP ratio, because that's the master that controls the production of all other tri, uh, tri, triphosphate nucleotides in the body, goes progressively down all the time. These cells are impaired in their ability to carry out TCA cycle activity oxidative phosphorylation in direct proportion to repetitive signaling through the T cell receptor. And I'll say it provocatively, so I won't say it now. We heard earlier about how the best, most effective CAR T cells are the ones that are fluxing calcium. We think calcium is the reason for this. That the activation of calcium through the T cell receptor, if it can't be resequestered, poisons the mitochondria over time. And it does it um, by poisoning the second step of the TCA cycle. And so you can see that carbon still, that these cells are taking up lots of glucose, carbon flux into the TCA cycle, but as many it is produced as citrate in the first step of the TCA cycle, it's exported to make lipid biosynthesis in the chronically stimulated cells. So these chronically stimulated cells cannot take cells past the citrate step in the TCA cycle. And that's because they have a a profound accumulation of reactive oxygen species that comes from calcium-induced increases in the activity of the production of NADPH that comes from the T cell receptor. And as these cells accumulate reactive oxygen species as they're repetitively activated through the T cell receptor, they inactivate the second enzyme in the TCA cycle. Oops. Oh, so just that reactive oxygen species is enough to begin to switch the phenotype so as they go up with ROS, they also turn on the transcription factor that is reactive to survival as exhausted tox. Um, I guess. But what they do do, and something that was reported years ago in core metabolism, is they inactivate the second step of the TCA cycle aconitase. And now you can't build any of the building blocks for non-essential amino acid biosynthesis, which come from the alpha ketoglutamate ratio. You can't build aspartate to make pyrimidine biosynthesis. You can't make asparagine. You simply can't make effector proteins because aconitase has an iron sulfur cluster that is completely destroyed uh, by lipid peroxidation of these cells. And you can mimic the ability to get exhausted phenotypes by simply poisoning the oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, since Hugh's up here, I'm not gonna go through that. We get the same phenotype. The reason to tell this community was when we actually asked if we just impaired the reactive oxygen species, could we get back an effector cell? We did this in tissue culture in one way by decreasing the amount of BME or decreasing the amount of cysteine to make glutathione that's present in the media you make. And as you do that, cells as they're stimulated through the T cell receptor activate tox and become, have it a really effector phenotype. Uh, but more importantly, um, if you add N-acetylcysteine in a dose-dependent fashion, you recover effector function during repetitively antigen-activated cells. And that's true of CAR T cells as well as cells exposed to checkpoint blockade inhibition release. Uh, and in fact, adding N-acetylcysteine is a better keeping gamma interferon function 
than is actually anti-PD-1 in this exhausted population of cells. Uh, it, it then starves their ability to be effector cells. Uh, they're much better at killing when you add both anti-PD-1 and an acetylcysteine. This is their ability to kill. So wild type cells that are not exhausted kill great. Uh, the exhausted cells don't kill well, but we can recover their killing by adding an acetylcysteine and anti-PDL1. And that works actually in a whole mouse as well. And with that, I will stop and simply uh, say that we are really excited to be back in the immunologic community trying to look at uh, some of these things that are going on in the tumor microenvironment. And I hope I've been a little provocative in making you think of you know, metabolites and the role T-cell stimulation and use of metabolites plays in this whole process. So thank you for your time, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you.